Hello, everybody. Um, I want to start off uh, right away by letting you know that I'm a lawyer. Um, please stay seated. Don't, don't run. I'm the good kind. I'm in recovery. Um, but being a lawyer, I, you know, there's going to be a little, a few things that I have to share with you ahead of time. You know, my disclaimers. Uh, but I also, as much as lawyers hate numbers, I am the rare exception. I love data. I love my numbers. I live by them. And so I'm going to share with you a lot today, a lot of different numbers of things that your corporations or companies that you work with, work for, are seeing. Um, they're kind of scary statistics because these are things that are coming that are breaches, right? Hacks that are happening. Uh, and then, you know, finally, I I'm just not here to bullshit you. I just want to make sure that the information that I have, you also have, right? We become stronger, as Jeremiah just said, we come back stronger when we're together. The more data I can share with you and the more that you can share back, the better we work together. And that's really the goal. So again, I warned you, I'm a lawyer. Few caveats, right? A few issues that we have to kind of hammer out, first of all. Uh, so first of all, the claims data that we have, it comes in from various, so, uh, various ways, right? Claims, first of all, the, the bat phone that rings, the events that come in, we capture that. But we also capture information from applications uh, that we accept or deny, like we say, no, we're not, gonna we're not going to have you as an insured, or from an excess layer, so from other carriers. We review their data. So we're able to bring in, hey, this entity had a past breach, and be able to share and ingest all of that data. The other thing that's different is our underwriting is very different. The way we, as an insurance carrier, the way that we underwrite is we underwrite to the technology. We don't underwrite to the loss. What does that mean? It means that we're identifying through our security team types of technology that cause greater harm, right? Three times more likely to, to be exposed to. You're gonna see that stat. 10 times more likely for this to occur, right? That is how we underwrite. We don't write to the PII, right? You have five million pieces of PII. We don't write to that because all that's doing is writing to the loss. We want to write to the prevention of the crime. And then finally, uh, the recent reported claims, right, as you can appreciate, they still grow. So this is a snapshot. This is what we're currently seeing. But I'm also going to share with you what we saw in 2022 and then what we're seeing now currently in 2023. I know you're, and listen, the fact that you're here is fantastic. Not everyone is here. But you need to understand that you and I, we share actually a common thread. We care about the same thing. We care about the security of your company. Two thirds of my company are, is security. Engineers that are trying to, in part, identify where future action threat actors are coming from and how they're getting in. Part of my company, that one third, lawyers like me, other people that are in the insurance industry that are here to help you write the ship. So if you're blessed to be one of our insureds, and I thank you in advance, you do need to know, just call right away. That's what insurance is there for. We're there, active insurance is there to help prevent it and where we can't prevent it, to help right the ship when something happens. So we believe in the wealth and future of your company. Going now into kind of the data, we need to talk a little bit about what we're seeing and what you need to know about. And then I'm gonna dive into each one of these buckets. Okay, the first one is that threat actors are increasingly sophisticated. You're all here at Black Hat, you know that, right? They're getting better and better at what they do. Most likely, if your company has been hacked, statistically it's through phishing. So you may not have been a target of choice initially, but the moment that one of the employees clicked on it, then you became a target of choice. And then finally, while in 2022, ransomware and FTF were going down, it has increased and is coming back for 2023. So we're gonna dig into each one of those buckets where we can go and talk about this more. The first bucket being that threat actors are 
far more sophisticated than they were even back in 2016. I can remember I was speaking at an event a long time ago, and we were talking about business interruption, right? Or someone was also was talking about ransomware, and they're like, oh my God, we paid a $5,000 ransomware. Now we say, oh, how cute, right? It's like, oh, that's really cute, $5,000. I'm like, hmm, okay, we'll take that. So let's talk about that sophistication and why that then correlates to why ransomware demands have gone up. You can see the difference right here. 2016, right? We have broken English, no punctuation. It's almost like I'm speaking to my teenage daughter through text. So no punctuation, no capitalization. Uh, ideas are not connected. They're, they're walking through, no identifying of what occurred, how it occurred, nothing along those lines. Flash forward to 2022, we have methodology. We have clear punctuation. We have grammar. I'd like to say thank you, AI, but that's really where it's coming from, right? And they're able to use your local dialect. Again, thank you, AI. So they are now talking about what happened, why it happened, how it happened, and how, if you want, you can get more detail. They go further. They're studying your financials. They know what you can afford. They know if you have insurance, they go and look for insurance files in your tree. So I beg of you, don't put your insurance and your cyber insurance information into your file on your computer. First of all, it'll do you no good when you're ransomed. Everything's encrypted. You're not getting your you're not going to find your cyber policy. Reach out to your ever trusted broker and or have it printed with you. I know, God forbid we use a printer, but it's there. Okay? But look, they go and they look for that. They know how much you're spending. They know who has power within your firm. And this is true. I just want you to know this, this is also true with funds transfer fraud. While they don't write you a script on it, they're doing the research, and we're going to talk about how long they're in your system and then how they're able to pull that. They also, as I was talking about, they know your organizational structure, but they know your relationships. They research your clients. They call your clients. They call your employees. They threaten your employees. They threaten your clients. They say, hey, if you want to make sure your information is in public, this is to your client, tell them to pay. Right? So we're dealing with a lot more things, right? They also, listen, look at the customer service they're giving you now. I mean, it's incredible customer service. Hey, we understand security is important to you. If you pay us, we'll delete it. Now, let's be clear, we've also shown that that's not happening. So you're trusting a criminal to do what they said that they're going to do doesn't always happen. But look at the difference in how it's happening. And then finally, as I had pointed out, they apply that depth. They want you to know, hey, look, we've contracted, we've contacted these partners. We've done all of this, so you need to pay. So now they've gone from, hello, how can I help you? This is your customer service, to, hey, if you don't pay, we're going to annihilate your data, we're going to go after your clients, we're going to go after your employees. So they've not only figured out how better to communicate what they're doing, but they've also figured out better tactics to hold your feet to the fire to pay. In addition, they've also figured out how to do this as a service. So they've realized that, hey, when, so you see Hive here. We all know Hive got kicked out. Look what happened, H2 2022, it's not there. Someone else filled that void. Those employees, and I say it that way because it's a business, those employees moved to another threat actor, because they have the ability, they have the capabilities to do what they're doing. So they keep growing, it keeps changing. It's very dynamic. So let's talk about then what it creates and what we're seeing, okay? So now what we're talking about is we're seeing these crimes, the tenacity, all of that stuff that we talked, talked about just with ransomware, I want to be very clear, it works with business email compromise, right, when someone breaks into your email system, which leads to a funds transfer fraud, and it also can lead to a ransomware, right? These are the things that it creates. So as you can see here from 
2021 to 2022, ransomware went up 10%. I hate to tell you, ransomware went up again in 2023. It's coming back strong. You can see BEC, FTF, kind of flat in frequency, but we also, and severity, but we're gonna see that, again, 2023, BEC doesn't increase that much. Funds transfer fraud does in terms of severity. This is the more, a little bit of bad news. Ransomware, as I, as I alluded to, has increased. It's on fire, it's increasing fast. And it's because it's very effective. It's a great way to monetize a crime, but this is how much it's gone up. 27% from H2 2022 to H1 2023. Another amazing way of monetizing the crime is funds transfer fraud, which we're gonna talk about again as well. If in my next life or when I retire, I might just come back and do funds transfer fraud for fun because it is beyond lucrative and it's super simple. So I can be at the beach during the day and do funds transfer fraud in the afternoon. It's just like a perfect plan. This is the number you have to think about. Okay, we're at now $478,000. We were at $300,000 last year. That's how much we've seen is an increase. Right? This is something that we're seeing, again, not just for our insurance, but we're seeing it from applications coming in. I just want to remind you of the data set that we're talking about. So frequency went up, severity has gone up, right? This is, again, H1, H2 2022, H1 2023. And we're seeing this going up again. We produce a claims report. You can go find ours online, but we're going to also do it now every quarter so that you can keep up on this, on this data. This, though, is a positive note. How you say is a demand of 1.4 million, a positive note. We are able to negotiate down, right? These are, this is the average ransom demand. This is how much, on average, the threat actor asks the first time around, hey, pay this amount. Now, I want you to be very clear. There are times that it's far greater because they find the cyber insurance policy within the tree, and they say, well, look, we know you have a $5 million policy. Pay us the five million dollars. Go to you, blank insurance company, and pay us the funds. We are able to negotiate this down through. We have our own forensic firm, Coalition Incident Response, but also other forensics firms, some of which may be here, so that we are able to negotiate that down from this peak demand, so that the impact isn't as hard. Now, why does that impact matter? You want to be able to drive that number down as much as you can, so that the it elongates the life of your insurance policy. If you have a million dollar policy and you're paying 1.4, you're already paying out your money. So if we can drive that down to $200,000, then we're able to get you data recovery, restoration, business interruption, right? We'd rather put the money into your pocket than into the pocket of a threat actor. How these threat actors are getting in is pretty much by phishing. What we're looking at are these numbers. 76% are through phishing, 76%. But when you add in end-of-life software or devices that are able to be seen, external remote devices, you're up in the well into the 90s. I like to say that that is actually showing human error. Okay, end-of-life software, end-of-life technology, you shouldn't have it anymore. And we're going to talk about the numbers of, what, of why and what it's causing. But if you can bring those down, right, bring that human error out of the way, because somebody within your company identifies that, hey, long, this is no longer supported, this is dangerous to our company, or you don't pop open RDP mid-year, right, because somebody just needs to fix something quickly, so that when... When someone's doing a drive-by, your threat actor, they're not seeing it and they're not seeing an easy way in. But the one that's obviously more difficult to get, but look at the big jump, 59% to 76%. The question is why? The answer is low-lying fruit. Threat actors have figured out that the easiest way into your system is through employees, customer service, click culture. 
So we need to start, and at the end of this, I'm gonna talk about the easy, easy way, MFA all day, the easy way of solving it. But that's what we're facing with. We're facing with the knowledge they have and they've learned, the threat actors learned, hey, if I'm gonna be in someone's system, it's gonna be done by phishing because they're sending out mass emails and they're not identifying and saying, okay, you're the company I'm gonna target. They don't have your name. They're just sending it out. And when you click, now they've got your name. Now they've identified you and they're like, well, now we've got the company we're going after. And then they start doing their research. I talked quickly about end of life software or end of life technology. This is why you need to have, and this is why I say it's human error. Because if a human doesn't know that this is technology that shouldn't be used anymore or software that shouldn't be used anymore, your company becomes three times more likely to be hacked. That's because nobody is out there supporting it anymore. There's nobody saying, hey, here's a patch for Patch Tuesday. Hey, maybe if you put this behind a firewall. Hey, if you protect it. No one cares anymore. It's dead to them. And so it is a wonderful playground for a hacker to keep figuring out how to get in. Because once they're in, there's no way to fix it, right? If we have a zero day, it's not a zero day because there's nobody patching it. There's nobody fixing it. That's problematic. I'm gonna shift just a little bit away from ransomware, but we're still in kind of that theme of, hey, why are these threat actors so smart and how they've gotten better at what they're doing? And I wanna talk to you about, again, my favorite crime, funds transfer fraud. Um, I was actually taught how to send out my phishing email, how to do all of this. I don't do it, taught how to do it. I just talked about steps one and two. Funds transfer fraud, let me just go back just for a second. Funds transfer fraud is essentially when they play, the threat actor gets into your email system, researches, figures out who has the keys to the kingdom, which is the checkbook, right? Who has the keys to the accounts? Who can say yes to paying something? Waits, looks for the right invoice, identifies and flags that invoice, and then plays monkey in the middle. What they're doing is they're in your system and says, anytime this email comes in, hide it into a, the hidden account, into the hidden file, and then they answer on your behalf. Very kind of them to answer on your behalf. But they're answering and telling you, hey, vendor, put the money over here. Or hey, Susan in finance, send the money over there. So the way they do it is quite simple. You either could be a target of choice because they know that you have a lot of bills that you pay and you become a target of choice, perhaps because one of your vendors has been hacked. And so they see in there, they're like, oh, wait a minute, they do a lot of business with ABC company. Let's hack them. And since they're in your vendor's account already, they can send over a very convincing phishing email because they're in their account, click on it, and off they go. Or they do it through a phishing campaign where they send out tons of emails. Whoever clicks on the fish is now the target of choice. So one and two can be flipped back and forth. I just want that for clarity. Then what we do is we start looking, right? The malicious login is performed, they're in. You can see that through all your logs, all your audits. You can see, hey, here it is. This is the date they first came in and the 20 other days they came back in and, in and out of the system. They then flag invoices that they want. So they may put up and say, let's do a search for social security number, let's do a search for employee bank account changes, let's do a search for vendor, invoice, money, right? These are the things they're doing so that every time one comes in, either a copy is made or it's just going into a file and then they can look through very quietly on their own time and decide which one they want to insert themselves in. They then right, have those mailbox rules to hide everything, and they move forward. Modification to the payment instruction. They send back something saying, hey, by the way, just wanna let you know, with all the banking issues that have come out recently, we've decided that we're gonna move to XYZ Bank. So if you could, just have the ACH go there. Someone responds, oh, do you need it to go to this bank for this, this next invoice? They write back, the threat actor says, I sure do, thank you very much, right? And that's how easy it is. That's why we recommend that for any new or any change in invoice payment. So 
a new one. Your CFO says, I'm on a plane right now, don't bother me, but please pay this invoice. That's a new one. We're gonna, we're gonna wait till that person quote unquote lands and call them at their last known phone number. Or your vendor reaches out and says, hey, by the way, we've changed our bank. You say, okay. You look them up and they say, oh, this is the last known phone number. Not the one in the email, last known phone number. So for new and change, that's the recommendation after you have MFA in place. And then it's just simple from there, right? The money gets wired, it sits at their bank, and then they start hopping the money around the globe so that we can't chase it for you. Whoops. This is how they're doing it. They're doing it by, again, we talked about getting in your mailbox, but they're staying in your mailbox almost twice as long. This is what they used to do. They used to go in, they used to find one little, one invoice for $5,000, $8,000, $2,000, play that card quick, and then go in, into the bank and wait for it. Now what they do is they play that card, they play for the next vendor, the next invoice, and they wait for the last one. They look for the most invoices they can get in one period of time, and they look for the largest. So during those 20 extra days, they're trying to find the right person in your company. They're trying to find the largest invoices that you have to pay, and they wait for those, and they want the ones that are on a more frequent cadence. And we've always talked about the fact that we're like, hey, but this is companies, and companies can rebound. Let's change that tune a little bit. Here's one where it was $6.4 million, and it was a union, and they were transferring it to the account so that the advisor could invest their funds. This is not a company. It is in the sense, but that money was for people that were to retire. And they transferred it because they received notice saying, hey, by the way, the investor, by the way, we've changed our, um, our account information. Please transfer the $6.4 million to this account, in this account instead. It matters. It's not only impacting corporations, which when you think about it, if a company were to pay an invoice to a threat actor of $6.4 million and then actually had to pay the $6.4 million again, that would put them out of business for the most part, right? Ransomware, at least we can negotiate down. We can, you saw, we can negotiate down the 1.4 million to 200,000. There's no negotiating down <laughs> once you've wired out those funds unless your insurance carrier has active insurance where they can work with, as Coalition did in this case, we reached out to government contacts, we reached out to banking, and we were able to, in Hong Kong, because now it had transferred to Hong Kong, stop the transactions there and claw back 5.4 million. That left 1 million, which we, they had insurance for, so we covered these things. We've actually protected the unprotected, those individuals that would not be able to retire. But those are the steps that you have to be able to take, and that's what you're gonna have to start looking for within your insurance. So one of the questions then is how do we protect companies, right? And what you're going to be looking for in your insurance. To protect your organization, you need to be looking to insurance as risk transfer, but also as security. But you also want to look at things like we talked about MFA all day. Like it's the easiest thing to turn on and you will be asked, and I've seen it a thousand times, it has to be a zero tolerance. I have had many cases that have come in my door that says, I said, well, how did this happen? You said you had MFA. We do. Okay, the CFO doesn't. Why? Finds it complicated, didn't really like it, and the CFO is the one whose email box was ultimately hacked. That transfer went out, that one was $2 million. These are the problems that happen when you bend the rule as well. So you need to make sure MFA all day, but also make sure that the rule is strong and held hard. But it falls to that human error factor right, that somebody is there to enforce it, that someone says the moment you come into this corporation, we use MFA 
and we all use it. And it's not just for email, right? This has to be on all your servers where you keep your private data, right? This is where you need to be able to so they can't get into your system and transverse it. End of life software, end of life technologies, we talked about this. We need to really look at patching. Have somebody that when you receive alerts from entities like Coalition for Insurance that say, hey, we found out that, that this is a way they're getting in and you have the technology, right? Take it offline, prevent it, but when you receive these alerts that something is end of life now, that you take it seriously. And then for backups, don't leave the key in the door, right? I could tell you all day long, I have security alarms on my home and this is great, but if I literally leave the key in the front door or if I leave the code right there by the panel, like, hey, this is how you turn the thing off, it doesn't work, right? Shut doors, shut windows, but when you have backups, make sure that you have them and you're not keep, like, keeping the key in the door, Fetter, like, keep them segregated. On top of that layer, right? Those are things, those are security measures that you can do yourself. This is where our two worlds meet now. What we're talking about is how can and what should your insurance company be doing for you? They should already be sharing data with you. They should already be sharing statistics with you. But they should also be offering you pre-claims assistance. So there's many times that we've received calls and in your company, someone will say, hey, I clicked on something, I gave them my password, and now you're sitting there and you're like, okay, how do I solve this problem? How do I know if they're already in my system or not? What do I do if they are in my system? Some just say, well, just change your password, you're fine. It's not gonna help. If they're already in there and they've already downloaded everything in your email or already in your system and already taking over, you know, access to everything or transversed it to someplace else. You want to be able to have that bat phone where somebody calls and says, hey, I clicked on something, what do I do? We can, your insurance carrier should be able to get you in touch with Breach Coach for free, work with forensics to say, hey, look, let's make sure the threat actor hasn't gone in yet. And if it's close in time and they haven't even noticed that you provided a password, they can go in, fix it, make sure that nothing's done, and then send you on your way, and then remind you to turn on MFA. Incident response, IRPs, this goes also with tabletops. You should be able to have an entity that helps you figure out what to do when it happens. Who are the right people to talk to? Who's the right person in your company to get notice first? Right? Instead of running in circles of being like, well, I told so-and-so that this happened on Saturday, but they didn't talk to so-and-so. You know exactly which team you're pulling together. You've also vetted breach counsel. You've vetted forensics firms. You know the path that you're going to be taking. You know where your data is. You know what type of data you have. Right? Those are those incident response plans so you have that. And one way to test it is through free tabletop exercises where you sit down with a breach counsel, with a forensics firm, with your insurance carrier, and with all of those people that are a part of that important group, and you talk about, hey, how are we gonna talk to each other? Someone's gonna say, oh, we'll just send an email. No, you're not, not if, you've been, if everything's shut down. How are you gonna talk to each other? Oh, well, I guess we can use a phone tree to call. Okay, good, let's start with that. Let's text each other. It's those small things that catch people up. Also, having your forensics ahead of time and having your breach coach ahead of time, it saves you time, which we've shown time and time again, saves you money. Ongoing scanning. This is active insurance. This is about alerting you when something is identified that you have within your technology. It does you no good if you're getting a thousand alerts about other companies and what they're experiencing if you don't have that technology. That's, that's alarmism, you don't need that. What you need is you need the insurance company to say, hey, we know you have this, please shut it down or patch it and do so quickly and this is how you do it. And if you need more help, reach out to us as a security resource. Coalition has an entire security team that, and a resource that can help you and walk you through step by step of saying, hey, this is how you do it, right? So you need to have those two things going together. 
And then just like we've done today, let's data share, let's share what we're seeing so that we can work better together, right, to solve all of your problems and then actually try to solve cyber risk. I have nine minutes and 49 seconds left. I'm sure you have questions. If not, I'm gonna, I can go to the side as well, but I wanted to leave some time if anyone has questions. I was told that in the rows, there are mics, uh, and don't, don't be shy. I find it hard to believe this group will be shy. Okay, well, I guess I answered all, oh, no, right there, yes. Am I on? Yes, yes you're on. Uh, so I'll volunteer, and first of all, it's a media question, by the way. Um, <laughs> and I appreciate your disclaimer that you're a lawyer. I think it was a great start. Um, on a serious note, a couple of questions. One, in the way you underwrite, mm -hmm. and in the, manner, in the, the, uh, uh, the mechanisms that you use, which is different from traditional underwriting. So one part of the question is, how well received are you by the insurance sector? The second part here is, how much shift are you seeing from those who normally buy the cyber insurance from the traditional underwriters coming to you and why? Okay, uh, so the insurance sector, those that didn't join us don't like us. <laughs> uh, so we are backed by some amazing carriers, Arch, Allianz, uh, Fortegra, these are our partners. They believe in the way that we're underwriting and it's beyond well received. Um, those that didn't traditionally are now shifting to try to catch up and learn how to and to be able to underwrite. Because if you think about it, underwriting to the loss isn't a way to underwrite. You're just figuring out how much you have to pay. Why don't we try to underwrite to prevent? That's the better part. Uh, and due to my age, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember your second question. <laughs> uh, due to my age, I forgot the second question. <laughs> well, then good, I answered it perfectly. No, but I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase the second question. <laughs> Is how much shift are you seeing from those who habitually mm -hmm. take the traditional underwriters that are coming to you in maybe uh, 2022, 2023, just as a percentage? Yeah, so I don't have a percentage, but I can say from... Um, instead of it being the underwriters. So the, the carriers that were traditional are trying to shift and they're trying to figure out how to use technology, how to use security, how to use, I mean, I have one of my security teams right here, how to use honeypots to do all that research, right? These are traditional carriers that, that weren't built to do and solve this risk. We were built for that. Brokers, though, have realized the service that we are providing to an insured through active insurance instead of just providing an insurance that sits on the shelf and is there when the event happens, we're there from the beginning to try to prevent it from happening. And so brokers are, our broker partners have, have welcomed it and embraced it because we're giving so much more to every single company. Okay, great. Um, I have a couple of other questions, but I'll That's take sure. that. That's sure, I'm more we'll than happy to take it over there. Things. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. You mentioned underwriting to the technology versus mm -hmm. underwriting to the PII. Do you have some sort of list or scoring mechanism that <laughs> rates a certain technology better than others? And if so, could you expand on that? Uh, we absolutely do. Um, as an insured, you get that for free. So you can actually go log in and see where you rack and stack against others in your industry. So what that tells you is, am I the low-lying fruit, right? It also, we send out alerts when something new hits that says, hey, by the way, you have this technology, we need to prevent it. But we also provide that, we've democratized it, and any one of you can go in for your corporation and see where you sit. And I, I can give you that information afterwards, but you're, aware, you're welcome to go in and look at that. Uh, and that will bring you to understand where you have greater risk. Weekly, yep. And our security team is doing it daily, minute. Like there, I cannot tell you the number of times that we underwrote to a technology a year ago, and let's just say, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, say six months ago, there was a big event where everybody else was on fire. 
And I reached out to the security team and I was like, bravo, well done. Because we underwrote it and what we did is we didn't say you have to pull it, and, but we said hide it. So if they can't see it and we can't see it, then they can't get in, right? That's when you become more of a target of choice and you know, target of choice is a lot harder. How do you get the organizations to work with you? Because the mentality is, we don't want to tell anyone what's going on because our insurance is going to go up and we're going to get all this marketing press and yada, yada. So how do you get people to, or get organizations from the top to say, hey, we're going to reach out. Oh, somebody was fish. Because mm -hmm. right now today, the first response is don't tell anyone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of education. Uh, working with our broker partners as well to educate our clients. And we actually have a lot of webinars, seminars, uh, where we talk about this very thing. Because I promise you, as much as you try to bury the lead, it will be found out. And not only then are you facing your class action lawsuit, you're now facing regulatory fines and penalties, you're facing all of these other things. And now you've got to, you know, if you're a public entity, you've got your securities actions, you've got all these other things. The reason insurance exists is to help you prevent the greater harm. And so I think by, by knowing that, but also on a pre-claim aspect, if you reach out, hey, we were just fished. We, I can't tell you the number of times that we've actually prevented a future attack from happening because we were able to get there first. So really realizing that it's a partnership and that we want to, when somebody has an event, we actually want to keep them as a client because now you're cleaner and you're actually more attentive than any other client who thinks it can't happen to them because you know that's not true. And so we want you still on our books. Yeah. Hi, do you have any recommendations around a large organization determining the level of investment in insurance, cyber insurance in particular? Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna have you turn around from your seat to meet Aon right behind you. Nope, right here next to you now from where your seat was. Uh, phenomenal brokerage house. Uh, they are the ones that are able to tell you exactly how much risk you can take on. Right, that's not for me to decide how much risk you wanna take on. What I'm here to help you with is ensure you so that if the day comes, I can help you right your ship so that you're not feeling the impact as strongly as you can. But you're gonna to wanna to look for things like a pay on behalf policy. So you want, think about it, you get ransomed and the threat actor's like, yeah, you have to pay $2 million. You're like, where am I gonna get 2 million in Bitcoin? You're not gonna walk down to the bank and be like, hey, by the way, yeah, we're totally gonna to pay you back, but I need $2 million to pay this ransom. They're gonna be like, get out of here. But that's what a lot of policies ask you to do. They ask you to front the money and then pay you back. We pay for you so that we're out there paying the money and then help you write the ship and move on. We want you back in business as quickly as you can because it's better for you, it's better for the economy. It ultimately solves the risk. And we certainly don't want to victimize the victim. Honestly, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being part of the solution.